Good morning. Welcome, everyone. Visitors and also Delilah Penner, welcome back. And others who are familiar, it's uh, good to have you here. <clears throat> this morning, we're uh, we refreshed by the rain, right? As we woke up this morning and we heard the, the rain, it was relaxing. It felt like just staying in bed a little longer. Uh, we've heard a lot already. Uh, Psalm 25 verse 5 was read in the opening as well as in Sunday school. It says, Lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. thought it was a very good verse. Uh, the topic for today is about uh, praying, and a lot could be said about prayer. Scripture has a lot to say. I'll only touch a little bit. We uh, heard a few comments on Sunday school already about interceding for others, and I, I totally agree with that, even though my focus will not be as much on that. Uh, it will mainly be focused on the Lord's Prayer and the verses prior to the Lord's Prayer. So the Lord's Prayer, it appears twice in the New Testament. It appears in uh, Luke chapter 11, and Matthew chapter 6. So we will look at those passages. We'll first uh, look briefly at Luke chapter 11. So turn with me to Luke chapter 11, verse 1. It says, On one day Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. So Jesus had just uh, spent time to pray in a certain place, which he probably had done many times, was probably usual for him. And then when he uh, finished, he had finished praying, he probably rejoins the disciples. Then they desire that Jesus would teach them how to do it. Lord, teach us how to pray. I find that noteworthy that the disciples asked Jesus to teach them to pray. Where do we find that Jesus, or that they asked Jesus to teach them how to sing, or how to preach, or, you know, so many other things that, that we could think about. Uh, Jesus told them to go teach all nations. Well, if Jesus told me to personally to teach all nations, well, my question would probably be, Lord, teach me how to teach. Uh, we find a little instruction that Jesus does give, and maybe there is a lot more that we don't find record of. But, Lord, teach us to pray, gets emphasis here. So we can... We can practice to sing well, we, we can go to school, we can, we can learn the skills, techniques of singing, uh, we can take training for uh, public speaking, we can uh, practice teaching, we can, we can improve our skills, we can, we can train ourselves to do the things uh, more effectively. But what good is it to sing well, or what good is it to preach well, or to teach well, if we do not know how to pray well? 1 Corinthians 13, it talks about how uh, many good things are worthless and empty if we do not have love. Uh, similarly, preaching becomes cold and empty, uh, powerless without prayer. I believe a minister can accomplish more through praying than through preaching. The same could be said of a leader, of a teacher, uh, evangelist, or whatever your ministry uh, as a father or a mother in the home with the responsibility of, of training your children, as a young person who has a burden or, or for someone else that you want to minister to, prayer is a very important key. Now, I'm in favor, favor of learning, uh, proving our way of ministering, to keep learning, to keep improving. Uh, Paul's letters to uh, Timothy talks about what we are to look for when we ordain uh, ministers, and being able to teach is on that list. So there's there's some point to the skill or the ability, but being able to pray is so much more important. Second Timothy 4 verse 3, I'll just uh, quickly read that. For a time is coming when people will not tolerate sound doctrine, but having itching ears, they will surround themselves with teachers to suit their own desires. So it says a time is coming when that's going to happen. I believe we see a lot of that happening today, even in in churches, I think it's happening. People look for the uh, most talented, most skilled, most educated speaker to preach, uh, the one who can most powerfully uh, present the message, most effectively stir up the emotions of the people. But are they also teaching sound doctrine? How is their prayer life? 
Some groups might do the opposite. They uh, react to highly skilled or educated, and they might heap to themselves people who contradict what the, uh, what the higher educated say. And looking at uh, my uh, Russian Mennonite history and some of the groups that, that still exist from that culture, I think my culture has sometimes uh, reacted to higher learning. And uh, is, our, is our doctrine still sound? Or do we surround ourselves with teachers that teach things that I like or that, that teach things according to my itching ears? When we uh, read or watch things online, what are we drawn to? Online sites, they're very often set up that, that they recommend or they advertise things according to what you've listened or, or seen. If, if you watch YouTube videos, uh, you'll soon see that the recommended videos are sort of related to the, the ones that you already watched and advertising and so on. If you go on Google, though, you'll look something up and soon you'll see advertisements that are, are connected to what you have looked up. So they're, they're, they're set up. It is their way of advertising to, to make us spend more time with their content. But they're set up to, uh, to feed our interests, to, to feed what our, our ears are itching for, and in a sense we could say it. So what is, what is driving us? Is the things we, we read and watch, is it helping us to grow deeper in our walk with God? Or is it just feeding our itching ears? So with all the opinions available to influence ourselves according to our interests, we need to be alert that we don't heap to ourselves uh, teachers surround ourselves with information that just feeds our interests. As the disciples, as they watched Jesus, I believe they saw that it was not about skill and learning. It was not about impressing the people. There was something deeper, and they connected that with prayer, with Jesus' prayer life. In Acts 4, Peter and John, they were arrested by the uh, Jewish council. And the rulers, the elders, and the scribes, they noticed something in Peter and John that they immediately connected with Jesus. Acts 4 verse 13 says, When they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and when they realized that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and recognized that they had been with Jesus. So their boldness was not because they were so well-educated or knew so well how to speak publicly or how to uh, convince the congregation. There was something much deeper that the council saw. It is true that they had been with Jesus, that the Holy Spirit was guiding them, but I believe a big part of this boldness was their prayer life. It was a result, a fruit of prayer. The disciples saw Jesus minister to the people, and they saw that prayer was a very important part of that ministry. If we want to minister in any way, we need to know how to pray. Let's go to uh, Matthew chapter 6. Starting verse 5. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and at the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your inner room, shut your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. Then your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. So the hypocrites, they love to be seen as a praying people. Simply, the definition of hypocrisy is to put on a, a false appearance, to make it look like I'm very religious, or to make it uh, look like I'm a praying person, uh, very dedicated to impress others, they, but deep down it's not what they want others to see. So we might say they are praying without praying. How often do we pray without praying? How do we know if we have truly prayed or not? Jesus says, when you pray, go into your inner room, shut your door, and pray to your Father in secret. Obviously, Jesus did not mean that we could only pray in the house, in the inner room, in a house. He obviously didn't uh, always do that. But we get the point of what true prayer is. Jesus contrasted the, the closed-door, inner room, praying to the Father, 
to what the hypocrites were doing, which was praying on the street corners to be seen by others. We see that very well contrasted. So the important part is not what others around us see. The important part of prayer is whether deep down in the secret room, the secret part of our heart, we are communicating with the Father. Our Father sees and hears us in secret. He sees and hears what is in our innermost parts of the hearts. Romans 8 verse 26 says, For we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with inexpressible groanings. The Spirit communicates from within our hearts things that we don't even know how to explain, how to express it, but the Spirit can do that. It can, it can communicate that with groanings, and uh, he intercedes for us. So that makes it very important that we allow full access of the Spirit into our our innermost heart, to all the corners of our hearts. Jesus says, Our Father who is and sees in secret will reward you openly. That means there will be fruit that will be visible. You may have been praying secretly in your room, but the fruit or the results of prayer will not stay in your room. They will be evident. They will be obvious openly. There may be a renewed sense of peace. There may be strength. There may be courage, boldness, a uh, sense of security, uh, whatever it might be. But those rewards will not stay in secret. God will reward us openly when we pray. I believe our power is in prayer. People notice when there is something deeper than just what we have learned or what we have practiced and so on, or just the words we speak. The council, they had seen Jesus, and they noticed that what they saw in Peter and John was similar to what they remembered seeing with Jesus. They remembered what Jesus was like, and when they saw uh, Peter and John, they, they connected it. They saw that there was a similarity. Maybe the people around us may not know enough about Jesus that they will connect the fruit of our prayer to Jesus. But when they see fruit in us, those are good opportunities to be a witness. 1 Peter 3, verse 15 and 16 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Always be ready to make a defense to anyone who asks you for an explanation of the hope you have within you with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that when those who revile your good conduct in Christ speak against you as evildoers, they may be put to shame. It talks about the hope. In Christ, we have a hope that the world does not understand, and that hope within us is one of the rewards of prayer life, one of the rewards that God blesses us when we uh, pray to him in secret. Let's go to verse uh, 7 in Matthew chapter 6. And when you pray, do not babble on repetitiously like the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. A few points can be made out of these verses, verse 7 and 8. Uh, sometimes we focus a lot on the uh, words we say while we're praying. This can be especially a temptation when we have prayer meetings or uh, when, when, a prayer, when we pray aloud and others uh, hear us what we pray. When we become very focused on what our words are, what, what, we, what words we use when we pray and how we say it, it can become more like public speaking or maybe hypocrisy, uh, than actually praying to the Father. Also, sometimes we tend to think that the person who, who can have long prayers, who can express himself uh, very well, is more spiritual than the one who only has a short, uh, simple prayer. Jesus says it's not about that. Our Father knows what we need before we ask. He already knows what is in the heart before we ask. And God understands the needs of the person with a short, simple prayer, just as well as the one who, who has a long, uh, uh, eloquent prayer, a, a detailed prayer about how he feels. Uh, verse 9. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus taught 
this prayer to his disciples, and it is there for our learning. It is a good prayer to memorize, but we must also keep in mind that we also pray this prayer, that we not just, just say it by memory, that we pray from the heart. Just saying the prayer by memory does not mean that we are praying from the heart. So that when we pray, we also pray. So the first part, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Who is the Father? Jesus says, our Father. Not everyone can say that. There was a time when I couldn't say that he truly was my Father. Ephesians 2 says, the first two verses of Ephesians 2 talk about how in times past we, we walked according to the course of this world, uh, living according to the lust of the flesh and the desires, uh, uh, desires of the flesh, and we were by nature the children of wrath. Okay, the children of wrath is not the same as the children of our father. In another verse, it talks about children of disobedience. When we live in the lust of the flesh, we cannot truly call the Father our Father if we are children of, of disobedience or children of wrath because then we are not a child of the Father. So I must accept God as my Father and live as His child in order to call Him our Father. I cannot say our if He is not mine. But there's also a point in calling the Father our instead of just my Father. In our uh, individualistic world today, the focus is often just on uh, my God and I. Uh, you can go your way with what you think God is telling you. Uh, I will go my way with what I think God is telling me. Uh, when we say our Father, then we have the same Father. Then we are of the same family. And then we are brothers and sisters, because we have the same Father. When we are brothers and sisters, and we are children of the same Father, then we should care for one another. Then it should make a difference what the other is doing. Then there is a bond that draws us together as one family. Our earthly fathers, in most cases, desire the best for us. Sometimes we as earthly fathers, we do not know what is best or we are unable to give. We, we maybe know what is best, but we're, we're unable to give what we, what we think is best for our children. But our heavenly father is not limited in any way. His love wants what is best for us. He knows exactly what is best for us and he also has the power to do the best for us. We just need to fully commit to fully uh, trust that it will be the best for us to surrender fully to him. So says our father who is in heaven. We distinguish our heavenly father from our earthly father. We have a earthly father here. We have a heavenly father. As young children, we are to be obedient to our earthly fathers. But as we become children of the heavenly father, we are adopted into a new family. Although we still love and respect our earthly parents, our ultimate allegiance is to our Heavenly Father. If our earthly parents are children of our Heavenly Father too, then we are brothers and sisters as well with, with our uh, earthly parents. So the Lord's Prayer is also, it's, I see it as a family prayer. It's not just about me and my needs, it's about us as a family of believers. So we begin this prayer, uh, this family prayer by addressing the head of the family first, which is our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. As children of the Father, we want our Father's name to be holy and honored. If our Father is honored, then we feel honored as well. If there is a, a good relationship between father and child, then, then we delight in when our Father is honored. I trust most of us, we have a, a fairly good reputation among society around us. We can, most of us can very easily find work. Uh, people in general tend to trust us. I'm sometimes surprised at how quickly clients uh, tend to trust things into my uh, hands. Um, and I think that's the case for many of us. It is good when we live such honest and upright lives that people see us as trustworthy. 
But our ultimate goal is not to get a name to ourselves. Our goal is to, to uh, have our Heavenly Father be hallowed, to ha let His name be honored and glorified. We, we're willing to, to sacrifice our reputation for the sake of lifting up His name, having His name hallowed. Your kingdom come. Our Father has a kingdom. There is a kingdom of believers here on earth already. And as we live as, uh, we are to live as citizens of God's kingdom while we live here on earth, that is also ruled by earthly uh, kingdoms. But Daniel says, uh, Daniel writes in Daniel 2 verse uh, 44 and 45 that God is going to set up a kingdom. Uh, he, just, uh, the, the, the illustration with the statue of the different uh, kingdoms. And then, then he says there will be a kingdom formed uh, like a ball without, made without hands. It is going to be formed. And that is going to take over all the other kingdoms. So uh, a kingdom not made with hands. We can be part of that kingdom here and now. But a better day is coming when that kingdom will destroy all the other kingdoms. And God's kingdom, the, the glory and, uh, and the power of God's kingdom will be fully displayed. It will destroy all the others. This kingdom is not established by people voting for certain political leaders or a certain country winning a war. This kingdom will be fully established by God himself without the use of earthly hands. As citizens of that kingdom, we welcome it in every way. So we, we invite God's kingdom in every way. Your kingdom come. That's what we, what we aim for. That's what we uh, live for. Who is in power here on earth? Who is prime minister? Who is president? Or uh, uh, what country is winning? And so on, so far is, is not that important to us. Our focus is the kingdom of our Father. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So in heaven, I believe everything is done according to the will of the Father. Everything goes according as our Father desires. There is no sin. There is no rebellion. We uh, read about that Satan being, uh, being uh, kicked out. But beyond that, I, I think heaven is a perfect place without sin, without rebellion, where everyone, uh, everything glorifies our Father. So we desire his will to be done here on earth as well. To be that obedient, that uh, the same way it is in heaven. And since our, our heart, our body is, is basically the only thing we have control over, we want to submit our will to his. Because that is something that we can control. I cannot control your will, but I can control my will. So we want to submit that to his. And that can be challenging at times. Uh, just thinking of different situations that we face, maybe a... Uh, you know, we can think of a, a young husband or a young wife at the bedside of a dying spouse. Uh, that, that's a difficult uh, situation. Or a, uh, a teenager uh, paralyzed by an accident, facing the rest of their life in bed or in a wheelchair, uh, so on. Submitting to the will of our Father is not always easy. It wasn't easy for Jesus either. We find in the garden, he, uh, Jesus prayed that this cup might pass from me. But the will of the Father was that Jesus would go through this cup of suffering. Jesus always come back, comes back and says, Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Thinking about praying according to God's will, I, I thought of a, a boy asking his father for something. So we would, uh, picture, let's picture a young boy who wants to go swimming. Okay, his, his friends are, are going to the lake, going swimming, and they want him to go along. But he needs his daddy's permission first. So in his mind, the best thing to do is for daddy to say yes. The best thing to do is to go swimming with his friends. The only thing that, that keeps him from, from the best thing is if his, his daddy says no. So just an example, his request might be something like, uh, Daddy, it's hot today. My friends are going swimming and we want and, and want me to go also. I haven't gone swimming for a long time. Please, can I go? I'll help with the dishes and help with the chores afterwards. Okay, so he will, he will try his best to, to approach 
daddy in the best way possible. He, he'll make sure to say please, and, and he, will, he will make different, uh, different offers of helping to convince his daddy that going swimming is the best thing to do. The goal is to make uh, daddy's will agree with what the son thinks is the best. Now let's imagine a, a more mature teenager. Uh, his request might be something like, uh, Dad, some of my friends are planning to go swimming and they invited me to join. I enjoy swimming in the lake and I'd, I have looked forward to spending a time with these friends. I would love to go, but what do you see? Do you think it would be good for me to go? So these are not perfect examples, but in one example, the goal is more to, to uh, nicely uh, ask nicely in order to get his father to agree with, with what he thinks is best or what, with his wishes. In the other example, the son expresses his desire, but ultimately the son wants to hear what does the father see. Uh, he, he wants to submit to the will of his father. He expresses his desire, he expresses what, what he would desire, but he wants to listen from the, uh, hear what the father sees. So when we pray, uh, your will be done. Is it just a nice way of seeing, saying, please God, say yes? Or do we truly want to hear what the Father's will is and desire to submit our will to His? Verse 11, give us this day our daily bread. Daily bread is what we need physically. Our physical needs are dependent on God. If God suddenly stopped the rain, if the summer was, was totally dry without rain, if the sun stopped shining, things like that, uh, then we would die, then we would not have our, our physical uh, uh, daily bread. So in other words, uh, Jesus teaches us to pray for our daily bread. We are dependent on our Father to provide us with, with daily bread. This is, however, not referring to riches and wealth. Lord, give us riches, give us wealth. This is, uh, give us this day our daily bread. So when we pray for physical things, it is good to consider why do we desire it? Why do we want bread today? Why do we want to fill our, our stomachs today? Is it for our glory or is it uh, for the Father's glory? Will, will our Father and His kingdom be glorified through it? Or is it for my own desire and for my own glory that I desire it? And I would like to also focus on the words us and our. Give us this day our daily bread. Again, we see a plural. A, uh, I think of it as a family or a kingdom focus. It's not about just me and my daily bread. In, earth, in the earthly family, we, we usually pool things together. Uh, there's usually one or more in the family that has a job, that, that provides income. And usually there's one or more that stays home and, and works, but not necessarily providing income. They're, they're taking care of, of the things at home. But as a family, all our needs are met because we, we pool things together. The one who earns shares with the one who works at home. What about in the family of our Heavenly Father? If God blesses you with a bonus at work or an exceptionally good year, who benefits from that? Very often the, the, the focus is, uh, what can I invest to make my profit better? Or uh, how can we improve our house or our vehicle or family trip or whatever? Well, what can I do to make life better? What if there is a brother or sister in the Lord who has basic physical needs and prays, give us this day our daily bread. And in response, God gives you a financial blessing. Have you considered that God could be blessing you to provide for the needs of your brother or sister? A common way of thinking among North American Christians is that if we first give 10% of our income to the Lord, then we have done our duty, then we have done what we need to do. We can keep 90% of our income 
for our own pleasure or to build up our own wealth. But when I look at the early church in Acts, I see a different picture. It was more like one family of believers that looked out for one another. They would probably have been in the habit, I know in the, the Old Testament it was very, uh, very strict or very ingrained to, to tithe, to give 10% of their uh, income. I believe it was probably the habit of these early Christians to do that already, but now they were selling possessions in order to provide for those that had needs in the church. Let's go to uh, verse 12. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Debts and debtors here, I uh, understand, are more like uh, sins and sinners. Some translations have, uh, have sin there. I think Luke 11 has translated it as sins, the first in King James. Some others, I think, have uh, both uh, sins and sinners. Anyway, uh, so this could be considered a mental need. I think unforgiveness is one of the greatest mental plagues that we face. When you think of conflict between uh, people, whether it is in the home, whether it is uh, marriage problems, church issues, uh, violence, or even a uh, world war, almost in any conflict that I can think of, deep down, there is unforgiveness that is, that is feeding the conflict, that is uh, keeping the conflict going. The last thing we want is for our Heavenly Father to hold something against us. We all desire to be forgiven, especially by our Father who has the keys to heaven and hell. And there is one condition in order to be forgiven by our Father, and that is to forgive others. This point is emphasized in verse uh, 14, 14 and 15. We'll skip down a little bit for those verses. Uh, for, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Verse 15, but if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So forgiveness is very important no matter who it is that has trespassed against us, but it is especially important if it is within the family of believers. Verse 13, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So I see this as a spiritual, if we think of, of uh, requests, uh, our daily bread, thinking of, of physical, uh, forgive as uh, mental, and then I see this as, as spiritual, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So this, uh, lead us not into temptation uh, does not necessarily mean that we uh, that we're not to be tempted or not to be tested because whom the Father loves, he also uh, chastens. So testing uh, times help us to grow. Rather, this refers to not being tempted above what we can bear. And then deliver us from evil. It could also mean uh, deliverance from the evil one or the devil. Some translations have that. Uh, deliver us from the evil one. So our goal here on earth is not to be uh, free of all trials, to live a life with, without testing, without uh, trials, but to be faithful and victorious no matter what we face and ultimately to be delivered from the devil. That is our goal, to be completely uh, delivered from him, which will happen in eternity. Then finally, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So we recognize that the kingdom belongs to God. All power and glory belongs to God for all eternity. It is not about me, myself, and I. It is not about my interest or my glory. It is all about God. And the word for indicates the reason for the things that have been mentioned. The reason why we desire his name to be hallowed. The reason why we want his kingdom to come. The reason uh, why we want his will to be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, the reason why we ask for our daily bread, uh, for forgiveness of our debts, and for deliverance from the evil one is because the kingdom belongs to him, all power belongs to him, and all glory belongs to him, and not just now, but while we live, but throughout all eternity, and it shall and will be forever and ever. Amen. I ask to stand. 
And for closing prayer, I'd like to slowly go over the Lord's Prayer one more time. And I invite you to repeat that after each phrase, if, if you so desire. Uh, but please pray from the heart and not just uh, with, with the voice. So let's pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts. As we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.